Well, hello everyone and welcome um, to health and wellness in the age of COVID, which hopefully won't be an age for too much longer, but it is for now, a call to action for higher education. And this is the first of a series of webinars, showcase webinars from the SUNY Distinguished Academy. Uh, you'll hear more about that going forward. My name's Rich Rosenfeld. I'm at SUNY Downstate Health Science University, and I'll be your MC and uh, host uh, uh, for this webinar. Uh, very quick thank yous are in order because a lot went into doing this. So in alphabetical order, I wanna thank Elizabeth Bringjord, who's the Vice Provost, Provost and Vice Chandler for Academic Affairs at SUNY. Ann Hawkins, Assistant Provost of Graduate Education and Research. They've both really helped shape the content, the speakers, the direction of this to, to be the great product it is now. Johanna Kendrick Holmes, who's Director of New York City Special Events and Programs, who is a wonder at organizing these things and getting everything in shape. Victoria Mizorian, who's Program Coordinator for Professional Development, a very detail-oriented person. Janet Nepke from uh, Oneonta, who is Chair of the Distinguished Academy Board. Uh, it was her idea to move forward with this in large part. Yvette Roberts, a Special Assistant to the Vice Provost and Vice Chancellor. And Jennifer Snyder, the Program Coordinator for Professional Development. Uh, I mean, it really takes a village to do this, and this has been an incredible village to work with. So just to whet your appetite so you know what's coming, for those of you who really relish and live for introductory and welcome remarks, your expectations will undoubtedly be exceeded by our SUNY Chancellor, Jim Malatras, and President of SUNY Health Science University, Wayne Riley. You'll be hearing in this program from T. Colin Campbell, who's a world-renowned nutrition luminary for more than four deca decades. He's best known for the groundbreaking book, The China Study, in 2005, and came out just this past December with The Future of Nutrition. Susan Benegas will be with us, the Executive Director of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. She is really a transformational person in the US and abroad. She empowers people to really understand how they can change their lives through lifestyle medicine. Sharon Brangman is a distinguished professor at SUNY Upstate Medical Center, directs the Nappy Longevity Institute. She's a past president of the American Geriatric Society. And last but not least, we will have a panel of incredibly talented and proactive downstate students, Ayanna Besson from the School of Public Health and from the College of Medicine, Gabriela Stavezanoa, G. Govind and Laura Stoyanova. We've tried to include something for everyone, so sit back and enjoy. Our goal is to really whet your appetite for plant-based nutrition, pun absolutely intended, and lifestyle medicine, which are not only key ingredients for higher education, but also essential for your own personal health, longevity, and resilience. So with that, let me introduce uh, Jim Malatras, our SUNY Chancellor, uh, he heads the largest comprehensive university in the United States, oversees 64 campuses with nearly 1.3 million students. Uh, Chancellor, thank you so much for your introductory remarks. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for allowing me this opportunity to uh, kick off the inaugural SUNY Distinguished Academy Showcase webinar. I feel like I'm a little bit set up if Dr. Riley is going after me because he is much more profound and much better at this than I, but I will try to do my best. Um, I wanna thank, uh, take a moment to thank the Distinguished Academy Board members and staff who put this event together. The Distinguished Academy is one of the gems we have in this system, and it does showcase just the profound impact we've had as a system on the intellectual curiosity and advancement all across this nation and the world. So thank you all for being part of this. I wanna to thank today's MC, Dr. Richard Rosenfeld. He's gonna do a great job, you can tell from the beginning. Oh, we, he got the puns going already. So if we got <laughs> puns going right at the top, we're gonna to have a good day. Of course, to our fabulous president of SUNY Downstate, Wayne Riley, who has been instrumental on the mental health and wellness side for the system. He has done phenomenal work from COVID, mental health and wellness, really helping our students. Um, and you'll hear uh, uh, from our, uh, his impressive students later in the program. 
And of course, our distinguished speakers, T. Carlin Campbell, Sharon Bragman, and uh, Susan uh, Benegas. Um, we look forward to all that you will present to us as well. We have a wealth of talented uh, talent represented across this system within our distinguished ranks. And this program is a welcome opportunity to highlight that incredible research, discovery and innovation happening at SUNY. Just a little dovetail at first. Today, we just announced the first ever Chancellor's Dissertation Awards for the best dissertation where they'll also will have awards for professional development. Then we will publish in an extend, their extended um, abstracts in a SUNY Press thing. I love to see that graduate student coming up the ranks and now talking with you all today in the Distinguished Academy it shows the arc and the beauty of what SUNY is and how much of a profound community this is and how you'll see some of those students in the graduate ranks become the Distinguished Academy ranks soon enough. So it's just a fitting day that we're doing this. Um, it's also really important that the first webinar that in this series is around health and wellness, especially in the age of COVID. This is something that I as chancellor and many of our colleagues have been living with, managing for a long time, especially at our medical institutions. From the onset of this pandemic, we've seen incredible strength and grit of our SUNY family in keeping us safe. Like downstate, they led the charge on becoming COVID specific hospital at the epicenter of New York City. They stepped up in big and meaningful ways. I was in a different spot at the time. I called Dr. Riley and he didn't hesitate. He was there to help and they've been there from the beginning. Our students and our faculty for volunteering their times and skills. They make critical PPE. They're graduating ahead of time in order to go in and help in the healthcare community. They've done everything right. Our doctors and nurses um, who have worked on the front lines, we can't repay them enough for what they have done and what they have done for this entire community. Uh, students, especially serving as counselors for their peers struggling uh, with isolation brought on by the shutdown and what they're living through now. Many of our students are feeling great isolation even with some of our students back, they're living in dormitories by themselves, they're doing remote learning. This has been a really challenging time for our students, including our faculty and staff. This has not been easy for anyone. Um, and then just members of our faculty and innovators like Upstate Medical. It's nice when it says SUNY's the one who created the number one in the world saliva test, or SUNY's the one who's the global principal investigator for the Pfizer vaccine. That's SUNY, that's a public higher education leading the way on research and innovation. So it's great to be part of that, just a small piece of that. And now we have even more work to do. The pandemic uh, exposed some of our challenges. It didn't create them, but it exposed many of our challenges. And it's, uh, we continue to test and vaccinate our campuses um, so we can hopefully bring our students back and our faculty and our staff back safely in the fall which we're undergoing right now. The vaccination process is really important, but we have to look at the longer term impacts and effects on the mental health and wellness of the pandemic and what it has created in our, among our college campuses, especially in higher education more broadly. I think we're gonna be dealing with the psychological effects of this for some time um, that this discussion is really gonna be important to carry forward. We all talk about the Zoom fatigue. We're all meeting on Zoom today for our probably 500th <laughs> Zoom meeting of the day, and it's only three o'clock. The stress associated with the pandemic, the anxiety and depression that we're feeling, food insecurity, economic insecurities, these are all issues we've heard directly from our students, and they're grappling with a tremendous amount in addition to their educational experience. So there's a lot of going on. And all of these have a direct impact on their mental health and well being, on their education, on their long term health um, overall. So I'm pleased to turn it back over to our healthcare experts that will help us learn better ways to address these disparities, promote wellness, promote mental health across system. I wanna be a model for this, the entire country when it comes to that. I think Dr. Riley and what he's been doing with the mental health task force is leading the way on that. Um, so I'm really proud to be uh, joining you for today's conversation. And now I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Rosenfeld. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to do 2021. You have to unmute yourself, which is everybody says it at least twice on a Zoom call. So there you go. No, are. you're right. You think <laughs> after a year of doing this, we'd figure it out. Uh, <laughs> anyway, th thank you so much, Chancellor, for the kind words thank and you, support. And i um, delighted to introduce uh, uh, Wayne Riley from SUNY Downstate, who is also the chair of the Board of Trustees at the New York Academy of Medicine. So welcome, Dr. Riley, and uh, look forward to your remarks. 
Well, great. Well, good afternoon, uh, all. I am delighted to follow our illustrious chancellor to, uh, to bring you greetings and to welcome you to this first webinar for the SUNY Distinguished Academy. And I salute all the members of the SUNY Distinguished Academy for what you can do on a daily basis for, for our learners, whether they are undergraduate, graduate, or professional. Um, you know, higher education is, is a wonderful way to, uh, to make a living, and, and thanks for all you've done. I'm particularly proud to kick this off along with the chancellor because we at Downstate feel that we have been uh, amongst the leaders, the leader of the pack, if you will, in terms of lifestyle medicine. It was shortly uh, just after I arrived as president four years ago that we created a committee on plant-based health and nutrition, which was a joint effort between our College of Medicine, our School of Public Health, and the, the office and uh, the borough president, uh, Eric Adams of the borough of Brooklyn. Uh, this committee put forth some uh, uh, beautiful statements and, and policy prescriptions, if you will, that was, was then endorsed by our medical executive committee of our hospital, University Hospital of Brooklyn, on how plant-based health and nutrition could prevent, manage, and reverse many of the chronic diseases that are highly prevalent in our community here in central Brooklyn. Uh, if you think about the chronic diseases that have been so critical uh, to the incidence and prevalence of COVID, uh, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, high cholesterol. And so this lifestyle movement that began on our campus, lifestyle medicine movement that began on our campus, uh, if you will, caught fire. It was then our medical students who uh, were inspired by the work that Dr. Rosenfeld and our faculty uh, you know, put forth in this realm that they created uh, the Dine Club, Dine refers to Downstate Initiative on Nutrition Empowerment. And this became the first colleagues, the first Metro New York Medical School last August to form an official lifestyle medicine interest group under the auspices of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, who you're going to hear about a little bit more today. But again, that is a, another manifestation of the great work that not only happens just at, as our faculty, uh, but as our students, our students have embraced this movement, this critical movement, because they understand that prevention has to be part of the toolkit of, of physicians. It just can't be treatments. It has to be prevention. So again, uh, the students, uh, like everything, uh, became very passionate about this. They've arranged webinars such as this for fellow students. They've submitted grants to uh, major medical organizations such as Alpha Omega Alpha to promote particularly in the African-American community, uh, the heritage of eating program in central Brooklyn, which again will work on uh, improving lifestyle and plant-based nutrition acceptance and, and so forth in the African-American community here in Brooklyn. So again, we've been working with faith leaders. Uh, we worked health fairs. We've again worked with the outstanding borough president here in Brooklyn, uh, Eric Adams to address what we refer to as quote unquote diabesity. Uh, that is the epidemic of both uh, diabetes and obesity in the community uh, that we serve here in Brooklyn and, and as well, elsewhere as well. So last, one of the true markers in my mind that this really had legs and had traction in our community was that under Dr. Rosenfeld's leadership, we had in 2019, we had a lifestyle medicine conference that attracted 250 in-person participants. And Chancellor, get this, it has a all-time record of a half a million views on the Downstate YouTube channel. Half a million views of this, this conference that we, uh, that we put together back in 2019 to talk about this, this, this issue of how plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine can make a difference in the lives of everyone. So uh, on behalf of uh, Downstate, uh, I salute Dr. Rosenfeld, I salute our students, I salute all of you, I salute Professor Campbell for his world-renowned leadership in this space, and I thank the Chancellor for, again, uh, underscoring by his presence, his words, that SUNY is a great contributor to improving the health of New Yorkers, uh, not just New Yorkers, but indeed uh, the country and I would argue the world. So uh, thank you very much. I'll turn it back to Dr. Rosenfeld. Th thank you so much, President O'Reilly, for those wonderful words, perspective, uh, and all your support. This can't take place without the support of the people you work for. And uh, that has been there. 
Uh, we'll move now to Susan Benegas, who is the executive director of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, really a pioneer in the field. Um, she will be introducing our keynote speaker, uh, T. Colin Campbell. So uh, Susan, take it away. Thank you, Rich. And I'm already inspired hearing from you and your esteemed colleagues. And, uh, and I'm just uh, privileged to be part of this event. Aristotle said that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. While Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. These two quotes are T. Colin Campbell's favorites. And as you'll hear from him today, why they are. I recently asked Dr. Campbell what he viewed as his professional crowning achievement, at least thus far, to which he replied, and I quote, staying the course in the face of serious pushback after listening to my father, an immigrant who had only a couple of years of formal schooling, who more than a few times reminded my brothers and me to always tell the truth, tell the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Colin said that for his father, he owed him so, so much, and that his achievements were the achievements of his superiors who made possible his career. Many would say that, as, as Rich referred to earlier, that the crowning achievement of Dr. Campbell's work thus far would be his writing The China Study, now translated into over 50 languages with more than 3 million copies sold. It's regarded as one of the most comprehensive studies of health and nutrition ever conducted and was recognized by the New York Times as the Grand Prix of epidemiology. I will say that this book changed my life. I read it in the fall of 2007 and shortly thereafter had the opportunity to meet Dr. Campbell in person and call him my friend today. And, and this has changed my personal and professional life. When I asked Colin what he would like his legacy to be, he said setting an, setting an example for young people, especially when they're first going out into the world following their education is this is such a pivotal time. And what an example Dr. Colin has been and continues to be for all who have had the opportunity to know him and learn from him. For more than 60 years, his primary focus has been on the association between diet and disease with extensive work in education, public policy, and laboratory research. He's the husband of Karen, the father of five, and the grandfather of many. He's a world-renowned speaker, the author of over 300 research papers, and the New York Times bestsellers, The China Study, as well as Whole and Low Carb Fraud, and his newest release, The Future of Nutrition. He's the recipient of many awards, including the American College of Lifestyle Medicine's Lifetime Achievement Award. He's the founder of the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies, and he holds an endowed chair as Professor Emeritus of Nutritional Biochemistry at Cornell University. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. T. Colin Campbell. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and, and we're gonna hear from Colin, uh, Dr. Campbell in just a moment. Uh, I have some tough questions for him that uh, I'm sure he's able to answer, but just, just real briefly, Susan mentioned the impact of the China study on her life. In my family, my youngest son got a hold of the China study about eight years ago as a gift from my dad and uh, annotated just about every page in the book uh, in his first year at Cornell, he came home and said, dad and mom, I think I'm going to try this vegan stuff for a while. And we said, oh, and he said, don't worry, it's just temporary. So eight years later, he's a whole food plant-based vegan. I'm a whole food plant-based vegan. My two other sons are whole food plant-based vegans. And my wife is almost in that direction. She's getting there. She's a flexitarian, we would say, but, uh, He's also uh, influenced my career, my son's career. So, so Colin, uh, you're an influential person. Thank you so much for what you've um, done. And I'm gonna start with the first question to you, uh, uh, taking us back to the, the 19th century when James Lynn, the Scottish surgeon, was showing the benefits of citrus, vitamin C, on scurvy. 
which was decimating the Scottish Navy at the time. And really ever since this time, the nutrition curriculum in medical schools has dealt with deficiency states and later macronutrients, micronutrients. Uh, are there limits to this approach? Is this how we should be approaching nutrition, Dr. Campbell, and in in training our students and professionals? Well, first, just let me add, add a quick word. Yeah. I really, really do appreciate personally and professionally this opportunity to elevate this topic of nutrition for such a, a wonderful audience, I'm sure, and for what you've done. So thank you very much. Uh, on that question concerning the so-called discovery of vitamin C, what they discovered at that time was not the vitamin C, of course, itself. It was the limes that contained the vitamin C, and that in turn was related to the alleviation of a condition called scurvy, if you will. And so then many years later, the substance of those limes that was identified as being responsible for that was vitamin C. At that point in time, at that point in time, it was a discovery of a single nutrient. And this was in the 1920s and 1930s, when we were discovering the effect of single nutrients on various and sundry disease outcomes. And so the focus ended up to be on single nutrients as an expression of nutrition, as an expression of nutrition. That set us on a, on a track that was uh, useful in many ways. We could learn about single nutrients, but that also became the problem in my view. We ended up focusing so much over the years on what single nutrients do as if they mean the whole, as if they mean the, the properties of the whole food. And so I'm going to suggest and have been suggesting, in fact, that somehow we've got to pull ourselves back from that focus on the details, on the parts. We've got to pull ourselves back from the parts and think about how things work together. And there's no better illustration of this phenomenon than let's say sort of looking at the cell of which there are trillions <laughs> and, and you know each one being a universe and there's so many parts and the whole though that the real message from all of this is that when we think of the whole the whole food the whole cell the whole body if you will what we find is that very common now a, a common uh, sort of uh, events a series of events all working together create what we actually call health. So that's discovered by Lind at that time, kind of set us on the course, quite frankly, ahead of its time to think about single nutrients. And we still do that. The single, the single nutrients and all their properties are useful because it gives us some, sort of gives us the, uh, the background, the un better understanding of the whole, but it's really the whole, really the whole. And it's really marvelous what we can do with the whole food, if you will. Mm -hmm. So if we're at the point now where we've sort of reaching the limits or seeing the limitations of focusing on deficiency states and macro and micronutrients, you know, within the, the SUNY system, we do have four health science universities and certainly a number of other graduate course offerings in nutrition, public health, wellness. So what implications does your research and experience have for how we approach this in higher education, especially given that medical schools typically have about nine hours of total nutrition education in the curriculum? Yeah, well, you know, the, 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 fact, the idea of what we eat, you know, namely the expression that's produced from the food that we consume, obviously, mm -hmm. that actually touches a lot of things in our lives, both personally and professionally and systemically, if you will. And uh, so in universities, whatever they may be teaching, and they're teaching everything, obviously, uh, I'm going to argue that, you know, choosing what we, what we eat can make a difference in all these different disciplines in various and sundry ways. There's hardly anything more important but unfortunately, at the same time, at the same time, there's so little known about nutrition. It is so, so confusing. So let me, let me suggest, if I may be so bold <laughs> at this particular point in time, nutrition is so important that if students, as they enter into their, you know, into their educational experience and straight, straight off, I'm going to ask, I'm going to argue that just knowing something about nutrition, something about food is really, really fundamental. You know, all students say that we have to have a language course. We've got a mathematics course. For those goals in science, we want, you know, 
they're there to be taken for them to be taken uh, chemistry if you will i mean i'm going to say it's going out on a limb and say it's about time now that we understand what nutrition can do it's about time we, we at least lead an overview course for all the students in a sense because it really does touch so many dimensions of our lives mm. and uh, so I, I think it's that fundamental it's that fundamental to who we are you know how we experience our health or unfortunately our disease at times and how we can actually modify and change our ways of thinking about things. It goes into economics, even. it goes into psychology. You know, the whole nine yards, this concept of whole is such a grand idea. We're looking at all these things working together. And all we need to do is look at nature and see what she did as if, you know, she, in a sense, put us together and created all these cells, each of which sort of did their thing. But each of it did it in a very comprehensive way complex but beautiful so teaching students this this idea i think is so uh, important just that concept of holism I, I really get quite passionate about that i must admit that the concept of holism which describes better the nutrition that we see than individual nutrients is a concept that applies to economics it applies to psychology we already know from prior research it applies in the area of physics so, you know, just recognizing all the parts, each of which are doing their special thing. When they work together, they do something even grander than their individual activities. So the university student, you know, first beginning to learn, learn basics. Nutrition is one of those basics. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think our, uh, the solution is the pipeline. It's the medical students in medical school because it seems like a lot of the residents and practicing physicians, at least in my experience, are not always terribly interested in this topic. Um, almost all the events we do at Downstate and, and other things, we get a host of allied health professionals, advanced practice providers, nursing students, public health students, dietitians, nutritionists, wellness folks, and probably the least interested, whether it's a webinar or a meeting, are the physicians. Um, and I think that will change if we promote this food as medicine, holistic concept in, in medical school, as you're saying. But for now, um, you know, we do have roughly 1.3 million people engaged with the SUNY system at some, in some capacity as students. And um, actually a little more than 25% of them are underrepresented minorities. And we have another 35,000 faculty and staff. For those individuals, do you have any advice for them as far as a starting point to learn about food as medicine and this holistic approach to their health and wellness? I think maybe the first thing to say is that, that nutrition is, of course, a very personal thing for all mm. of us. We like to be healthy. We like our families to be healthy, obviously. And uh, if we can actually just learn what happens when we choose to eat that kind of food for a while and it happens so fast surprisingly fast if they can just realize the personal benefits that they get you know from that kind of thing i, I think that also it relates to all the other sort of disciplines that I, that I just mentioned uh, and in terms of thinking about how the system or the educational program may may help others to learn how, how about this you know, in a more equitable kind of environment so everyone enjoys. You know, when we understand nutrition, we became the, the agent of our own activity. Mm. In other words, we can make our own decisions, what to eat. And that translates into less, less uh, health problems, lower costs. And of course, then we can also learn a, a lot about well, where do we get this food from? How do we produce it? And many of the SUNY system programs, for example, campuses, they do have opportunity to teach a little bit about, uh, you know, how food is grown, how it can be actually put into a, in a system, in, in a sense. That, so, so that basically it's, a, it's, it's, it's a sustainable. Right? I think that's the key word, the actionable word these days. So we can have a sustainable food production system that's equitable. It, it basically can influence people at all levels of our society, 
all levers of economic sort of well-being in a sense. So I think it's a very equitable idea because we can make our own decisions. And if we just have access either to the opportunities to grow our own food to some extent, that's limited to some, some extent, but nonetheless in urban areas, suburban areas, uh, we need to think more about how to get the food that is grown brought to the, to the people in the streets, if you will, right there, fresh food. And so uh, I, I like to think of food as being the great equalizer in many senses, because we can all make our own decisions, regardless of our status in life. If we just knew the information mm -hmm. and if we just in turn, what really allow our authorities, or especially our governmental authorities to distribute this kind of information to educate all of us. It's truly amazing. And as they say in the return, it's so fast. It is so fast. And then all of a sudden, and of course, we're not spending the same amount of money. And, and in turn, it leads to now in the modern day, we know that food is a major, major, it's the wrong food, I should say, wrong food production leads to major equi uh, environmental problems as well. That's a big deal. That is really a big deal. So uh, food, I just, I can go on and on, but it touches so many sort of facets, perspectives of our lives, even philosophically, scientifically, everyday experiences, socially, the whole nine yards. So I think the Sunni system is grand, big, lots of opportunities from the urban to the suburban to the rural. We can find ways to talk about food in a different way and recognize it's the same answer throughout the whole system. Eat plant-based foods and make sure that the whole foods, and I, I'm not talking about eating foods intact <laughs> all the time. We can chop and cut them up and all that sort of stuff. So when I say whole, which I, I like that word, I'm really talking about when we consume the food, we're in a sense, simultaneously consuming all of its contents at the same time, whether it's cooked or not cooked, uh, we have mixed, we can mix and match foods as long as they're plant-based, as long as they're plant-based. Now, having spoken to the reason not to consume animal foods, but we got some time, I'll, I'll comment on that too. Well, I, I couldn't agree more that it's just such an empowering message that it we're is. not the victim of our genes. We're not the victim of our predecessors who had heart disease or of our social environment or even our financial status. Eating healthy can be exceptionally inexpensive and easy. And we can all really overcome uh, challenges, promote resilience just with simple, simple choices about what we eat. And um, I'll point to some resources later on on that. Uh, I wanted to also just elevate this a little bit. We, we've spoken a bit at the educational level at the medical schools, the students, the faculty, SUNY, but it, it really seems, Dr. Campbell, that there have been some deficits at the federal level in terms of really promoting the right research from the NIH and others on plant-based health and nutrition. Um, I, I know you have some thoughts on that, so would, would you share that uh, with the audience about where we could possibly go to to really improve our knowledge, understanding, and, and ability to develop, disseminate, and have an impact in this field? Uh, sure. I, I spent quite a number of years really intensively involved in national food and health policy development at fairly senior levels, you know, at the national government level. So I, I saw what went on, what goes on, so to speak, behind the curtain. Uh, bad decisions made by good people. Let me, let me phrase it that way. Uh, we're, we're sort of, in a sense, caught in a paradigm by which we tend to express what we think we know, you know, comes from our past, et cetera. Having said that, as a little bit of background, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture is responsible for developing dietary guidelines and therefore, you know, uh, impact with their funding, the way we produce food, uh, that's one of the major agencies that sort of inform us. They can do a better job, uh, you know, in talking about, rather than talking about sustaining the existing food system, which is not helpful, rather than to try to get us to think more about a more equitable, equitable economical model to use for all of us. 
The other uh, body of the government too that's important in this regard is the NIH, of course, the Department of Health and Human Services. NIH is the major funding agency for medical research has been throughout the world as the number one uh, funding agency in the world. And they funded virtually all of my research over the many years I was involved. And so I'm a great fan of NIH. I like to program what they have, but they have like 27 institutes, each devoted to a specific disease or source group of diseases. And so we got these 27 different institutes. That's the source of the funding for doing the research. There's not one of those 27 institutes is called the Institute of Nutrition. And I've been howling away about this for some years, not getting too far. I, I, at times I get quite discouraged, but uh, quite frankly, nutrition is a holistic expression. It's not, in, in a sense, it's not saleable, it's not marketable. You know, we talk about the parts, they become marketable. So it's understandable how they fit within our economic system. Nutrition with this holistic characteristic, whole food, that doesn't make enough money for people. So we got some tough questions really tough questions and discussion we need to have in order for, let's say, the government to recognize this concept, okay, then sit back, all of us, sit back, talk amongst each other, and try to figure out how do you convey this information to the public? And how do you convey it to the public in a way in which, you know, it fits within our free market system? That's also important. We can't, we can't ignore that. But we certainly can have some discussion about where does nutrition come into this get the USDA, get the De Department of Health and Human Services where the NIH is, sort of essentially under that, that health sector. These are two big agencies. They have a lot of money, a lot of political clout to say the least. And so they've got to be taking more responsible positions so that the public gets to know which is the best kind of food to eat and to produce rather than just figuring out which cookie is the best, you know, or which, uh, which uh, kind of uh, steak to have in a sense. You know, we've got to really put our heads together, recognize what the problem is, and then determine you know, who amongst us are in a position to be able to formulate policy. And how do we elect politicians who in fact tend to control those organizations and the, and the leaders of those organizations? Uh, yes, yeah, a lot of work to be done. But it starts out with really a fundamental understanding, in my view, of what the heck kind of food ought we be consuming. And once we get to that point, and really all of us, you know, put our thoughts and experiences together, they all triangulate down to a common view. I'm absolutely convinced if we could just wrestle with the science, we come down to a common view, and that is we should be eating plants. And I, I'm, I'm not saying animals, and I came from a farm, milking cows, and so I came from that background. I know it well. It was quite a transition for me to make for professionally as well as personally. But wow, it works. <laughs> it works. So yeah, we need government to step up to the plate, so we say. And so, so those are the... Uh... The two key words, it works, I think to remember. And I can tell you that based on my experience and others and just go view forks and knives and you'll see how it works there too. But at this point, I wanna turn it over to uh, Susan Benegas from American College of Lifestyle Medicine to uh, moderate about 10 minutes of Q&A. I see there's a couple of questions in the Q&A queue, so to speak. Uh -huh. Uh, there's plenty of room there. Feel free, audience, to enter your questions. I know Dr. Campbell likes them to be real tough, so uh, so don't hold back. But uh, uh, Susan, and if there's not Thank much you. there, you're certainly free to improvise your. Uh, yes, yes. Care. Well, I know a question that's so often posed to Dr. Campbell, and love hearing his uh, answer to this is: there's so many myths. So dispelling the myths, what needs to be done and is most effective to dispel the myth that eating healthfully, eating a whole food plant-based diet is more expensive, too expensive. And then the myths around protein and calcium. But we'll start with, is eating a plant-based diet an expensive proposition? And what do you tell people in regard to that? Well, I, I hear the stories about that and they're usually the full spectrum of uh, thoughts. 
uh, I hear tell that, you know, it's hard to eat this way because it's more expensive, if you, if you will. Uh, perhaps referring to the thought that we need to eat organic foods. Uh, organic foods, yes, on the basis of science we have is helpful. But uh, on the one hand, but the most important decision to make is just eat the plants. And, and when we eat the plants, they are quite frankly, all across the board. I mean, they are simply cheaper. It's not more expensive. It's not more expensive, except in, unfortunately, in the inner city areas where people have less opportunity to get that kind of food is very sad. That's a political question, economic question we need to address. But we, we need, certainly from a societal level, we produce plant-based foods far more cheaply than we produce animal-based foods. Number one. Number two, on the, anim on, on the protein thing that just you commented on, you know, we tend to, historically, I can see this so well, going back to the days of Hippocrates, quite frankly, it, it turns out that we tend to uh, have a, almost a, a reverence for eating animal food we have for decades, centuries, if you will, uh, especially since we discovered the key ingredient in animal foods, nutritionally, that's supposed to be doing the job, namely protein. We, we discovered protein in 1839. We gave it the name protein from the Greek word proteos, which means of prime importance. Ever since 1839, protein has been the most revered of all nutrients. And it's the key nutrient that determines dietary choice throughout the decades and the years since. Now it's become institutionalized. It's become part of our paradigm. It's part of our subconscious thinking. We need to have enough protein. The point is, and this is easily provable now, we do not need to eat animal foods to get the protein. Yes, protein is important, but we get all the protein we need from plants. It's just, not, just simply not there. My early research, Susan, as you may have heard many times, uh, was when I started my research, I was a great uh, advocate for consuming more animal-based protein. But then in my work in the Philippines, work with malnourished children, we were expected all of us were, to make sure these malnourished children got more protein. I saw something that didn't equate with that. They were more at risk of getting Western kind of diseases. And so that caused, that's, that initiated my um, research. And we found out that animal protein in an experimental laboratory setting, experimental animals, quite frankly, we could turn on cancer by increasing the consumption of animal protein and turn it on by decreasing our replacement plant protein. So this, that's really what got me into this thing and you know, wholesale. When, when I saw that turning on cancer with animal protein, elevating blood cholesterol, and then doing it by multiple mechanisms, just like a tsunami of mechanisms all working together to create this response that gave rise to the concept of holism. And so those two ideas, we don't need the animal protein. We simply do not need it. That's that's myth. And if, number one and number two, when we're consuming more animal protein, we consume less plant plant foods. So that's the, that's the equation. We if we consume only plant foods and then decrease plant the animal foods, which we don't need. That's where we get the broad spectrum of benefits like reducing heart disease and actually reversing these diseases in many cases. So it's a means of treatment. It's actually a means of treatment. It's just not preventing the disease, it's a means of treatment. It's so fascinating when you look at all the different perspectives and look around. I mean, we're looking at the world, we're looking at nature. And I think she knew what she was doing when we, she fashioned us as to what we are and how we, how all of our cells and the trillions, you know, each do their thing and all at the same time, they're all orchestrated to do and work together. What a fascinating concept. I could just go on and on. I, I just find, I find uh, nature to be poetry, you know, and, and uh, you know, music, if you will. Great yes. art. It, it's absolutely, whole absolutely. Well, we have many questions coming in. Another question that just came in, what do you think is the best way to help people new to, to this way of eating to get started? What kind of supports do you think are most important for helping people make big dietary changes? Well, uh, family support is always helpful. If it's not there, I say that in that, in that stage because 
if family support, if there's some, th those in the family are uh, unalterably opposed, it makes it difficult, let's face it. On that particular, with that question, and some find it easier than others find it, there's one little thing I think is helpful. If we eat this way and stay with it, let's just put our heads into it, those who, those who may not want to do that, stay with it for a month or two, maybe three, something like that. What we discover is our taste preferences change. We see that we see the biological benefits pretty quickly. If we've got a disease condition, it reverses. That's amazing enough in itself. That convinces a lot of people. But for other folks who are otherwise healthy, they just want to change. Keep in mind this. Don't react negatively to this idea in the first day or two or three, even the first week or so. Stay with it because after, as I say, it seems to be like a month or two, it varies somewhat. Our, our preferences for taste actually change. And I get to a point where, and others do too, and I'm sure Susan, you've seen this too. We crave a salad for crying out loud. We crave a salad. And uh, that's the way it is, it, it changes. And, and, and this is true for all ethnic cuisines. I'd like to add that little dimension too, because this is not just, you know, correcting the Western diet. It's something that applies to all the ethnic possibilities. You know, so stay in with it, stay in with it, get in their minds. This is health. This is not so hard after all. Don't. Excellent, excellent point. Excellent point. Um, this is a great question. Uh, at our school in Buffalo, Lucille Leon is conducting community based research on mobile markets, the veggie van that provides fruits, veggies, and other helpful plant foods to underserved communities. This is health promoting, but isn't part of the problem that the farm bill subsidizes corn and soil that is fed to animals in factory farms. Shouldn't our government skip the middle cow and subsidize the foods that are most healthful for humans? Yeah, that uh, Dr. Roosevelt just sort of inferred something of that sort. Uh, yeah, you know, we, I, it's very discouraging. Uh, I, I was in uh, Selma, Alabama, not Selma, uh, Birmingham, Alabama a few years ago when they had a wonderful program there bringing in food into the from the countryside and having these marketplaces in, in the inner city. Wonderful, wonderful idea. If they need some subsidization for making that happen, we'll give them, well, let's provide some subsidy for making that happen. But the important thing is we've got to bring in this fresh food for all of all of our friends and and uh, people in our society. And that's one way to do it. So um, I forgot what the beginning of the question was, but uh, yeah, but well, the subsidies, and we've got lots of questions rolling in, so I'm going to squeeze in a few more here. Uh, is a plant-based diet appropriate for children? And if so, at what age? Yeah, it certainly is. It's appropriate for pregnancy, believe it or not, before the child is born. And pregnant women, uh, you know, at the birth, and from there on, from there on, we've got 11 grandchildren now, and, and uh, six of them are under the age of uh, seven, so it's not in the recent years. They've had the full benefit of my wife preparing uh, her ideas and mine and so forth. They started up from day one, eating this way. And that's what it is, it's their lifestyle. Uh, and so the science uh, also suggests that children raised on plant-based foods they don't grow quite as fast. That's fine. That's great. They can still attain their genetic potential, if you will. They can, they can attain that. But children, actually, it's a good way to start because it's a lifelong practice thereafter. But also, it helps their, their, their health in, in the meanwhile, you know, while they're through their teenage years and on into their, into their 20s. And, and, we, and one thing I might add that does attract attention those who want to get in sport, they do not have to have all, all that protein. They actually get better performance mm. for doing that. So from birth until the day comes, we actually should be in this way. Excellent answer. I know there's lots of questions, Susan, but uh, for time purposes, we're gonna have to defer them. Uh, we may have some time later, but thank you for moderating and thank you so much um, uh, Dr. Campbell if you're if you're able to stick around I think you'll really enjoy hearing some of our student uh, work coming up in about 15-20 uh, minutes but uh, sure. appreciate you very much and 
it's a, a real joy now to introduce uh, uh, our next speaker will be Sharon Brangman, who is a distinguished service professor and the chair of geriatrics at SUNY Upstate Medical Center. She also directs the Nappy Longevity Institute and is a past president of the American Geriatric Society. You can read more about Susan and actually all of our speakers with the link that's been distributed uh, previously for the program. So uh, Sharon uh, will be speaking uh, to us about Alzheimer's disease, uh, more specifically how diet and exercise can impact the really rising incidence and prevalence of Alzheimer's. So thank you, Sharon, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Richard. So um, I'm in geriatrics and um, I spend a lot of time taking care of, of older adults who have Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a disease of aging. And even though geriatrics is much broader than Alzheimer's disease, they definitely overlap. Right now, it's um, uh, often confusing when people hear the word dementia versus Alzheimer's disease. And um, most of the dementias are related in, in some way or another. The brain has some common pathways as it's kind of degenerating. But Alzheimer's disease is the number one dementia in the United States. So that's why you often hear it used interchangeably. It's the sixth most burdensome disease. Over 6 million people are impacted and everybody has been touched by this, either directly or indirectly. About half of all residents in nursing homes have Alzheimer's disease. And I always say I have two patients when someone comes into the office. I have the patient who signed up and registered, and I also have the caregiver, the person who brought them in, because caregivers are also devastated by this disease. They have to spend a lot of time taking care of someone who is starting to have problems getting through the day. And they have uh, billions of dollars of unpaid care that they spend. So this is a significant problem. Alzheimer's disease is probably the quintessential chronic disease because as we learn more about it, we realize that it probably starts in our 30s or 40s or maybe even earlier. So if we have a chronic disease that starts that early but it doesn't manifest until you're in your 70s or 80s, what does that mean for prevention? What does that mean about our diet and our lifestyle? Many people don't think about the health they wanna have until they're 60 or 70 or above. And then they come to me and say, well, how do I age better? What should I do? And I always say, uh, successful aging starts with good prenatal care. So even though it's never too late, the maximum benefit may actually happen decades before we need it. And that may be demonstrated in Alzheimer's disease because we now know that it starts in a subclinical way many, many decades before we actually see it. Right now, there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. So if we can prevent it, that is as good as a cure right now. There are a number of agents that are under uh, study, maybe soon to be released this year, that are actually disease modifying and have the potential to maybe stabilize the disease progression. But we really do not have anything that's a cure. So when we don't have a cure for a disease, if we can postpone it and if we can prevent it, that is um, just as good as a cure for now. We want to postpone that time when people are really debilitated and need a lot of care. So if prevention is key, what kinds of things can we do to prevent it? And if this is a disease of aging, when should we really start? So if you're 85 and above, you have about a 50-50 chance of developing um, Alzheimer's disease. And, and when you're in your 60s, it's about maybe 12 or 13%. But that may be too late to start thinking about prevention. Alzheimer's disease is a very complex disease, and I am pretty sure we're not going to find one pathway for treatment. It's going to likely be a combination of treatments because it looks like it is a combination of vascular changes, perhaps chronic inflammation, and of course, lifestyle choices. It's not as much of a genetic uh, disease, although there are some people, especially those who get early onset, do have a genetic um, predisposition. But for most of us, there is no strong genetic component. And a lot of it has to do with chronic diseases and lifestyle. So when we talk about diet, and uh, Dr. Campbell certainly gave us a lot of information, more than I, 
I get in med school. And if you wanna know how to make doctors pay attention to nutrition, you have to put it on the boards because everybody studies for the boards nowadays, even in med students. So if this is recognized by um, our professional organizations and if it's on board exams, then it will be taken seriously. But in terms of looking at diet for preventing Alzheimer's disease, we don't have very clear information right now. Most of the information has been looking at the Mediterranean diet. And so any diet that helps to keep your vascular system or your blood vessels healthy may help to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease because of the, the vascular association between chronic um, atherosclerosis and inflammatory changes that happen and what we eat. So the Mediterranean diet has a focus on foods that are eaten as close to their natural way as possible. The focus is on lean meats, um, away from red meats, certainly away from fried foods. The focus is on complex carbs that you would get in vegetables, especially those that are highly pigmented, that have high nutritional content. And the focus is away from sugars and simple carbs. We have a clear association between people who eat high processed foods and simple carbs and the uh, development of diseases such as diabetes and hypertension, which we know increase your risk factors for developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the Mediterranean diet also focuses on healthy fats, staying away from the saturated fats such as butter and animal fats and looking at olive oil as an alternative. The other thing in the Mediterranean diet is wine. And here's a little bit of a paradox because everyone drinks red wine now in order to help maintain good brain health. And the resveratrol that's in it is an antioxidant, which may help with some changes that we might see in the brain. However, we have to remember that alcohol is a neurotoxin. And I've had many patients over the years who had high alcohol consumption and developed alcoholic-based dementia. So alcohol, despite all that we hear from the alcohol and wine industry is a neurotoxin. There really isn't a safe amount, but alcohol has been so normalized in our culture that everybody thinks that it is okay to drink. We do know that it is probably not a benefit for brain health, for an aging brain, and alcohol is a depressant. And there's a clear association with depression and the development of Alzheimer's disease. So we have to think very carefully about alcohol being a, a neurotoxin and increasing uh, depression. We want to reduce vascular ri risk factors in order to reduce our, our risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. And that means we have to look at those diseases that we know impact the vascular system diabetes being one of them. And in fact, in some research, you will find Alzheimer's disease being called type three diabetes because the same insulin resistance that is developed in the body that causes diabetes can happen in the brain. And when we see insulin resistance in the brain, we see a lot of the changes start to happen that then lead to Alzheimer's disease. So we want to avoid diabetes. And one of the best ways to do that is with diet. Um, and again, I'll talk about exercise in a minute. Uh, we wanna reduce insulin resistance. And one of the good ways to do that is with exercise. If you have hypertension, there are studies that showed that controlling your systolic blood pressure can reduce your risk for mild cognitive impairment. And mild cognitive impairment we now know is probably a, prodro a prodromal um, anticipatory part of the path toward Alzheimer's disease. And many people who have mild cognitive impairment do go on to progress to Alzheimer's disease. So good blood pressure control is important. And how do you do that with diet? You wanna watch saturated fats, salty and processed foods. Uh, smoking is not good for our vascular system. And we know that smoking increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease and stress as well. Stress causes inflammatory processes, chronic re um, release of cortisol when you're stressed increases your risk of getting diabetes and hypertension. 
and it causes wear and tear on your blood vessels. There have been no randomly controlled trials that can confirm the benefits of most diets and most diets are observational studies. So getting good nutritional research to look at Alzheimer's disease in terms of prevention is critical and it is a challenge because again, when do we start? If this is a chronic disease, this is something that probably needs to start many decades before we actually see it. There are other studies that have been done that showed no benefits in cognition or improving cognition depending on diet. So again, this is an area that needs more research. The complexity of Alzheimer's disease and the complexity of, of nutrition research kind of come together here. And it will be interesting to see what evolves over the coming years. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about exercise. And exercise is a very important component of a healthy lifestyle. There's probably no downside to exercising across the lifespan. And as certainly as we get older, there are complete body benefits, not just for the brain, but for the entire body. And when I speak about this to most of my patients, they say, oh, well, I'm active. You know, I walk around the house and I go to my mailbox and I'm up and down the stairs and physical activity is good. We all know now that sitting is the new smoking. So getting up and moving every hour or so is very good. But exercise is different. Exercise is planned, it's structured, it's repetitive, and you have to sustain it for a period of time to get an effect. One of the little caveats is that people always say, um, why are dog owners healthier than cat owners? Well, dog owners are walking their dog often many miles a day or, or per week, and that ends up being a benefit to your health. But sustained exercise, 30 minutes of brisk walking or other aerobic exercise, three or four days a week can reduce your risk for Alzheimer's disease by as much as 48%. But again, the question is, when should you start? We do know that exercise benefits even frail older adults who are 85 and 90 and older. But the benefit and the prevention of Alzheimer's disease probably means that we need to start this and sustain it at an early age. Now, every time we exercise, there are the production of brain-derived der neurotrophic factors that help to increase nerve growth and help with hippocampal um, growth. And the hippocampus is like the switchboard in the brain that we have known for years when it starts to atrophy and shrink and get thin, has a direct correlation with Alzheimer's disease. Exercise also helps to solidify new learning, new information. And I often tell med students, one of the best things to do after a long session of studying is to go and work out because that will help lay down all that information that you've been studying. And it's one of the best things you can do to help your brain learn new information. We also know that exercise modulates the activity of acetylcholinesterase, which is an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is an important neurotransmitter that's needed for all sorts of memory um, uh, consolidation. And we know as we get older, cholinergic neurons start to decrease and decline. And some of the treatments that are currently available for Alzheimer's disease, particularly the cholinesterase inhibitors, do something similar to the benefit of exercise in, in that they reduce that enzyme's ability to break down acetylcholine. Therefore, there's more available to the synapses for function. So exercise is a natural way to do that. And I often tell my patients, it's probably better than me writing a prescription for these medications. Um, we also know that um, exercise improves the degeneration of these cholinergic neurons in the basal forebrain, and it helps the plasticity of neurons so that they can replicate themselves better. If we add some muscle strength, uh, weightlifting several times a week, that's also a benefit. And there's an indirect benefit in that it can reduce your risk of falls. Falls can change the life of older adults, especially if they're associated with head trauma, because that can then lead to cognitive decline. 
Do you, do you so have any concluding remarks? Because we're out of time. Oh, yes. I'm just in a, I'm about to end Thank right you. now. So again, we don't have a lot of uh, randomly controlled trials looking at this, but the science of it indicates that a combination of regular exercise can actually help solidify uh, memories, improve hippocampal uh, size and function. And if you combine that with a healthy diet, you may help to reduce your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And thank you for your attention. Wow. Well, what a great message. You all just learned that uh, you can keep your brain healthy by doing two simple things, a, a little bit of exercise. And if you haven't already looked at them uh, in 2018, the second edition of the physical activity guidelines for Americans came out and it's just 150 minutes of uh, you know moderate intensity. Some walking a week will will really help you. And this plant forward, or you know, in this case, Mediterranean type diet. So, and I love the analogy of of type three diabetes. That's that's really a great one because uh, we know a lot about type two diabetes and how healthy eating and exercise can impact that. So. Uh, we can extend that to the insulin resistance concept for the brain. So th thank you so much for a very inspiring and enlightening talk. And I'm gonna bring back now um, uh, Susan Benegas from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, who's gonna share with us some thoughts about uh, lifestyle medicine in general, uh, COVID-19 and, and higher education. What, what should we be doing as educators and people involved in higher ed? So. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it fine. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, what an inspiring presentation. Dr. Brangman, I wrote down the quote, successful aging starts with good prenatal care. That is a quotable and lots of great information. I so appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, and to talk about lifestyle medicine, COVID-19 and higher education and the urgent call to action. We'll start with the definition of lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine is the use of evidence-based therapeutic lifestyle interventions, including a whole food plant predominant eating pattern, regular physical activity, restorative sleep, stress management, avoidance of risky substances and positive social connection. These used as a primary modality delivered by clinicians trained and certified in the field to prevent, treat, and often reverse chronic disease and select autoimmune conditions as well. Lifestyle medicine, we often say, is synonymous with value-based care and that it produces superior outcomes while reigning in costs. And it's definitely the needed solution for our nation. So again, simple, powerful therapy based on these six pillars, which we also refer to as the six domains, many of which were just mentioned in the previous talk. Uh, and it is conventional medicine, evidence-based conventional medicine, but it takes a very different approach. Our current healthcare system, often referred to as a disease and disability care system, is really around allopathic approaches and our medical education system is, as well. So it diagnoses symptoms and treats those symptoms with ever increasing quantities of pills and procedures with disease management is the clinical outcome goal. And the difference with lifestyle medicine and our advocating for a lifestyle medicine first approach is to first attempt to identify and eradicate the root cause of disease. So the clinical outcome goal is health restoration as opposed to just disease management. So it's treating root causes and it really does reignite the passion for why all or most went into the field of medicine to become true healers. So it's a real antidote to the epidemic levels of physician and pro provider burnout that we face today. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine that I have the opportunity to be executive director of is the nation's medical professional association for physicians, allied health professionals, healthcare executives, as well as students and trainees in healthcare related fields and in medicine. And uh, ACLM supports 
uh, clinical practice, education, certification, uh, with an abundance of resources, network opportunities, and, uh, and is considered by many to be the fastest growing medical professional association in the country today. Trailblazing leadership since its inception in 2004, with many of these faces being ones you may recognize, including Dr. T. Colin Campbell. Uh, Dr. John Kelly was the founding president of ACLM, and it was he and founding about 100 founding members at the time that looked and saw that there was no other field of medicine that represented evidence-based therapeutic lifestyle intervention to treat and reverse already existing disease. And the chronic disease epidemic 16 years ago was such that there was an urgent need far more urgent now because we do have a chronic disease epidemic in this country. We have 60% or more of all adults already diagnosed with one chronic condition, 42% or more already have been diagnosed with two or more chronic conditions. And it's, this does not capture all who are chronically ill and may not even know, nor does it speak to the children who already have chronic disease today. When type two diabetes can no longer be referred to as adult onset because so many children are being diagnosed with this lifestyle related chronic degenerative disease, the urgency speaks for itself. And we are in a crisis. Healthcare costs are continuing to rise with the upward trajectory of chronic disease. We're already at 3.3 trillion just last week. Reports came out that the Medicare trust fund faces insolvency as early as 2025. Yet we often speak to the good news through our Lifestyle Medicine Economic Research Consortium that 86% or more of all dollars spent on healthcare pay for the treatment of conditions rooted in poor lifestyle choices. And that's good news because it means that we can do something about it before it's too late, but we must do things differently. We cannot continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. And COVID-19, one of the silver linings amongst all the heartache that it has brought is that it has shown a bright light on the urgent need to address the underlying health conditions that so exacerbate the most harmful effects of the virus. And these underlying health conditions being, by and large, lifestyle-related chronic diseases and the disproportionate impact on our underserved populations. So it's really making uh, the need for lifestyle medicine all the more vital. And there's such a, such a link between chronic disease and COVID severity uh, that's captured by all who are looking at the data from the CDC and beyond that those with chronic conditions faced far more vulnerability to the most harmful effect, effects, hospitalization and death. Patients with underlying conditions were 12 times as likely to die of COVID as otherwise healthy people, according to the CDC, and such a disproportionate impact as well. When we looked at deaths from COVID, uh, it was our Black, Hispanic populations that uh, really bore the burden because, again, of the direct correlation of the far greater precedent prevalence of chronic disease within those communities. Uh, so the health gaps remain widespread. Uh, and we are really taking active steps within the American College of Lifestyle Medicine uh, to address health disparities. Um, chronic disease, again, this is an epidemic. It is a pandemic in and of itself uh, that we must address now. And that starts with medical professionals who understand what's at stake. And that's really what ACLM represents. A pill for every ill. That has been the focus of an allopathic approach uh, to diagnose the ill, prescribe the pill. We have 70% of Americans now taking prescription meds, 90% of all seniors. We spend more in this nation than the rest of the world combined. And while we are so grateful for modern medicine and lifestyle medicine physicians and, um, and primary care providers prescribe medications, it's part of their toolbox, but they start with a lifestyle medicine first approach, which we need all medical professionals across this country to embrace. So that first and foremost, the focus is to treat root causes, to identify and eradicate the root cause of disease with health restoration, as opposed to disease management as the clinical outcome 
goal. And when we look at what's driving chronic disease, as we've been focused on today, diet is the leading cause of chronic disease and disability. And even the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation out of the University of Washington, which is the largest repository of health-related data around the world, in its 2019 Global Burden of Disease Report, and looking at data from nearly 200 countries, found that it's what people are and are not eating that's the leading cause of disease and death. Uh, many voices, one theme. Here it shows all of these organizations from the American Heart Association to the American Diabetes Association, of course, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and beyond that all uh, are proponents for eating more whole unrefined plant foods. So this is something that's there, but it's just not getting through. And why is it not? Uh, also, when you look at lifestyle changes, first line of defense, the clinical guidelines of all of these institutions listed here state that diet and physical activity changes are a critical first line treatment for many chronic conditions, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, uh, often before any medication is prescribed. Yet, this is just not getting through. And why? Well, it's because our medical education system has been allopathic focused. And uh, what Dr. Brangman spoke to, that the medical boards, the medical boards in this country include very few questions on anything related to the six domains of lifestyle medicine. There's some questions on um, smoking cessation and on smoking, and when it comes to diet, on sodium perhaps, but there's a huge gaping void that needs to be filled. And uh, it's just so inspiring to see the leadership at SUNY Downstate uh, being on the forefront of this transformation of education. And uh, we are leading the charge. And there is an education imperative because we know that when we survey our members, many of our physician members say that they received three hours, three 60 minute periods of training on clinical nutrition as part of their formal medical education. Uh, and it's on average 19.6 hours of nutrition teaching. And yet we know that it's what people are and are not eating that's the leading cause of disease and death. And so we must have a complete overhaul of our medical education and healthcare related education in this country. And the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is helping to lead that charge as well. Uh, we see that filling the gaping void that exists is our highest, highest priority because we know that we don't have time to wait. We need exponential impact and that individuals may see documentaries, read books, feel led to change, but if they go to an unenlightened medical professional, uh, too often they will hold the trump card and we need our medical, medical professionals to be trained so they have exponential impact, to be trained in evidence-based lifestyle medicine, integrating it into their own lives and into their clinical practices. So they touch thousands of patients and we see a ripple effect across this country of a shift in dietary lifestyle and adoption of other foundational pillars of lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine is in the center of primary care, specialty care, the sciences, uh, and it is just imperative uh, that we boldly step out and promote lifestyle medicine training. ACLM focuses across the entire education continuum from pre-professional through to undergraduate medical education, graduate medical education, all the way through continuing medical education and certification. Many of the offerings include Lifestyle Medicine 101, developed by Harvard's Beth Frades, who's our president-elect, in-depth syllabus that's been downloaded thousands of times from our website, and uh, robust uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations ideal for pre-professional uh, audiences. We also are supporting with dedicated staff uh, the establishment and support of lifestyle medicine interest groups on your campus and many others now uh, on more than 50 campuses across the country and in talks with nearly 90 other campuses nationwide to establish 
new lifestyle medicine interest groups. We offer Taste of Lifestyle Medicine micro grants ranging between $50 and $250. Uh, individuals, students, and faculty members may apply for these up to four times a year to cover the cost of plant-based foods as part of other educational uh, happenings that may be happening on the university campuses or through other training. Uh, we also offer the culinary medicine curriculum, a very in-depth curriculum developed by Stanford's Michelle Hauser, former board member. This is available through our lifestylemedicine.org site and the Lifestyle Medicine Residency Curriculum uh, that debuted last year. Uh, that is a uh, very, very impressive uh, curriculum developed in partnership with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and Loma Linda Health. This oh, is a we are out of time, show. Dr. Benegas, do you have any, uh, Susan, do you have any concluding comments at this point? Uh, I would say, Rich, that uh, the time is now for medical education and uh, and we are leading the way, and we so appreciate the fact that uh, that SUNY Downstate is as well. And we really encourage medical professionals to become trained and even certified in the field of lifestyle medicine, so we can champion the transformation of health and healthcare across this country. So. Th thank you so much. And, and the work of ACLM has been transformational and, and it is growing incredibly fast. Uh, it, uh, you know, I've known Susan for a number of years and she's an incredible dynamo and powerhouse in this field. The resources are fabulous. We established our lifestyle medicine group. You'll hear about that. Uh, I went ahead and got uh, board certified myself in lifestyle medicine over the past year. And uh, um, it's been an eye-opening experience. So thank you and thank you for what you do. We're going to turn now to our student panel, which I think, uh, you know, for me is one of the most exciting parts of, of this webinar. Um, this was entirely unexpected. When we started our Committee on Plant-Based Health and Nutrition a number of years ago, I never expected the groundswell of student interest, but, but not just interest initiative, enthusiasm, passion. Um, uh, if, if other doctors I know were half as enthusiastic as this group, we'd be in great shape. So um, it, it's a delight to have them here and you'll be hearing um, uh, uh, from the students. I'll introduce them as, as we go. Um, I'd like to be able to, to share the screen. Um, so let me see, am I able to do that yet? Uh, yes, I think I can. Let me pull up what I wanted to share with you all. So just to get this um, introduced, I wanted to share a little bit about uh, the forerunner of, of what we're doing, which is this Committee on Plant-Based Health and Nutrition. And um, I'd encourage you to go to the website shown here. It's very simple, downstate.edu slash plant dash based. Downstate.edu slash plant dash based. Uh, maybe we can put that in the chat. Uh, but the interesting thing is all the resources. So we have an about us page. And as was mentioned by our president, Dr. Riley, this is a joint initiative with the Brooklyn Borough President's Office, the College of Medicine and the School of Public Health. We have a position statement, um, very detailed. Uh, that uh, has been fully endorsed by our medical executive committee for a number of years. And I encourage you to look at that. Uh, there's a lot of free links to conferences and webinars. I've been looking at the Q and A, a lot of questions are pragmatic questions on how to get started. So um, I've recently put a few presentations up here on live long and stay healthy, lifestyle behaviors, uh, myths and facts of plant-based eating, eating for health and longevity. We had a wonderful uh, webinar with Milton Mills on health disparities in nutrition. Uh, the conference, uh, uh, we, we had an interview with Dr. Greger regarding his new book on how not to diet. Uh, and there are links to uh, that over half a million view conference that you heard about, including the individual parts of it. So uh, lots of things worth seeing there. 
for those research wonks among us who like seeing lots of articles and studies, we have a research summary that is updated regularly. It's about 25 pages and it, it shows everything uh, all, all articles, systematic reviews, randomized trials with explanations. It, it's really quite in depth. So if you're interested in all the randomized trials related to obesity and being overweight, you can see those. You can see all the cohort studies. It's, it's really a nice resource. FAQs, lots of FAQ documents, um, you know, starting with simple questions about vegan diets and vegetarian diets. So um, that's available for you as well. Uh, myths and facts statements. Uh, we're very proud of this guide to healthy eating, uh, which is a resource that we uh, recently put out there. And it's a practical guide, gets into all aspects of plant-based health and nutrition, uh, deciding what to eat, uh, how to get the, the protein you need, how to do it on a budget, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of really nice material there. Um, and we have lots of links to all sorts of uh, sites, including Dr. Campbell's uh, Center for Nutrition Studies. So that's the whirlwind tour of our committee. Um, and our students are part of this and have participated. So uh, with that said, I'm going to uh, stop my share. Um, if I could figure out how to do that somewhere. Uh, let's see. I guess new share, it says, but um, there we go. Somebody helped me, thank goodness, because uh, I wasn't uh, getting it there. So let me turn now to our students and our panel. And uh, I think uh, I'm going to start, um, uh, you know, we'll start. Uh, uh, Ayanna Beeson, uh, Besson is with us, and um, Ayanna is with the School of Public Health. Um, she's uh, uh, been very active with the Lifestyle Medicine Interest Group. So I, I'd really like, uh, uh, Ayana, if you could start with a few words about what is this LMIG, Lifestyle Medicine Interest Group, which we heard is part of ACLM. And um, uh, you know, how does this benefit Downstate? So let us know, take it away, Ayana. So well, thank you for having me. Um, so the Lifestyle Medicine Interest Group was founded at the top of the academic year in 2020. And we really just wanted to unite and provide a space for students who are interested in lifestyle medicine and, and plant-based diets and fill that void between nutrition education and our respective curriculums. Um, some of the things that we've done is our um, bi-monthly uh, speaker series. And the one that's most notable to me is the uh, call to arms uh, that a uh, uh, our Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams had given to us that really showed us how important this work is and what we're doing is meaningful. Um, the reason that I got into this actually is because my background is in type 2 diabetes uh, prevention with a focus on plant-based nutrition and so the, the lifestyle medicine interest group, their goals aligned with my personal and my professional goals. And um, this summer, I hope to start the process of getting certified in lifestyle medicine and continuing the work that I'm doing with Plant Powered Metro New York um, and their Jumpstart programming. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. The work of this group has been extraordinary. Uh, and uh, let me jump to, uh, to Laura Stoyanova from the College of Medicine. Laura, you're the one who really got the Lifestyle Medicine Group off the ground, and you've already won awards and recognition. Uh, uh, give us your feedback on, on maybe how this could be a bit of a model for other SUNY campuses. We do have other health science universities and, and medical centers. And also, can you tell us a few words about this online education initiative, the, the Food is Medicine that we're pursuing? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be on this panel. Um, I'm a big fan of, of your work, uh, Dr. Campbell, and you have inspired me as well to pursue a whole food plant-based diet. So their list is growing. Um, I would say that I was very unsure at first starting off this group if there was student support, but I have been so pleasantly surprised by all the students that have participated, 
all of the faculty that have come to help us. So if, if there's any students out there at other campuses thinking of starting a group, I myself heard about it um, through a talk that I went to, that talk that you mentioned, uh, Dr. Rosenfeld with Michael Greger um, and Susan Benningis for, um, that you just mentioned. And that's how I learned about the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So yeah, any student out there who's thinking of starting a group, just do it. And there, there's gonna be so many students that are happy that you started it and wanna take part. Yeah, oh, I and, think, yeah, yeah. And, and the nice thing is, um, uh, uh, you know, Laura and Ayana, you can chime in here. I think the structure and resources from American College of Lifestyle Medicine uh, are very helpful. And there's also a level of accountability I know as your faculty advisor, I have to scramble for a meeting coming up next month and share all the wonderful accomplishments as a faculty advisor. But, you know, I, I think having this structure and support from ACLM has been critical. Would you agree with that? Uh, oh, yes, certainly. There's so many resources on their site about how to start um, different activities just to get things going. And once you're, you're, once you're in the groove, um, things just grow exponentially, at least in our group, it has been that way. And yeah, there's some accountability that you, you are part of this organization, um, but they also have a lot of support, like the micro grants that were mentioned. Um, it's just, and there's meetings with other leaders across the nation and you just become part of a bigger global, I shouldn't say global national organization where students just support each other. Um, and we have been really, we have been really lucky at Downstate to be connected with the Committee of Plant-Based Health and Nutrition. And uh, we're lucky to have Dr. Rosenfeld be our advisor and be so passionate about this as well. But if, yeah, if there's any faculty and students in other campuses, they should certainly start a group there too. And I'm sure Susan would love to help you uh, go in the right direction. And we heard from Dr. Riley earlier that really the predecessor to the lifestyle medicine interest group was the DYING, the Downstate Initiative for Nutritional Empowerment, which is one of about 80 medical student groups at, at Downstate supported by the College of Medicine. And Gabrielle Estevezanoa, one of our medical students is currently chairing that effort. So uh, please share with us a little bit, Gabrielle, about DYING, uh, what you do and, and why it's important. Of course. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to be in this panel. Um, DINE, uh, as was mentioned before, it's short for Downstate Initiative for Nutritional Empowerment. And our, our main goal is to empower people to um, uh, learn about nutrition and also uh, at their own pace, uh, adopt a plant-based uh, uh, diet. Um, and so uh, through DINE um, and really um, LMIG as well, um, we, we started um, a project uh, with a, garden, a rooftop garden um, at the hospital so that we can uh, create a space for patients to learn more about nutrition. Um, and it has been just a wonderful uh, opportunity uh, to see it become from an idea to uh, almost a reality. Um, with already funding available for it. Yes, uh, we will hopefully get that garden going either as a rooftop or outdoor, it's in flux, but when passion meets purpose, as they say, nothing can stop it. So I think there's a lot of passion and purpose among these uh, uh, students. Uh, Jigar, Govind, I haven't brought you in yet, but uh, uh, GIGAR has been active in all of these uh, initiatives at, at an officer level, but he's been spearheading something called the Central Brooklyn Food as Medicine Initiative, which is a student um, uh, created uh, grant application through Alpha Omega Alpha. It's a very prestigious application. So what are you hoping to achieve, uh, GIGAR, with this Food as Medicine Initiative? All right, thank you for having me and I'm very honored to be here. Um, well, this Central Brooklyn Food as Medicine Initiative uh, started out as a way of bringing healthy eating and lifestyle medicine to our community in an engaging and culturally sensitive way. Um, 
And so we have the unique privilege of serving a large population of black and brown patients coming from diverse backgrounds. And so our initiative involves partnering with members of our community, uh, suffering from chronic conditions to, together to navigate uh, what is known as the taste of African heritage curriculum. And we have this course uh, led by our uh, student volunteers that will involve live cooking demos, nutrition education, discussions about food, culture, heritage, and, uh, and a lot more. And parallel to this, uh, we'll be developing a substantive uh, leadership and mentorship training curriculum for our uh, downstate students provided by our faculty team here. I think worth, worth adding in here is that these efforts cost money and we've been blessed with the support for this. We've had wonderful support from the medical staff, the medical executive committee for our, our conferences and to support the, the garden initiative. Um, the uh, College of Medicine and uh, 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 particularly uh, uh, Dr. Riley, the president's office has supported our initiatives as well and kicked in support. Um, we have support from the Brooklyn Borough President's Office to do another food as medicine initiative, an online educational thing that, that in a moment I'm going to ask uh, Laura to speak about a bit more. Um, and there have been personal contributions as well. So it's really been gratifying to see the support that comes for these efforts. Ayana, I want to just go back to you. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that you're thinking about the uh, certification in lifestyle medicine, that's a, a big leap. Um, and, you know, I'm curious, as someone in the public health school, I know research is very important. Um, uh, do you see any research efforts or, you know, that was a goal of our committee initially was to help support research. Do you see it through the lifestyle medicine group, DINE or the committee? Where do you see this going as far as some potential research opportunities? Well, um, what I can say is that um, uh, partnering downstate and the School of Public Health partnering partnering with uh, Plant Powered Metro New York and Lifestyle Medicine Interest Group is very well in with Plant Powered Metro New York. And so um, for me, and then we have a uh, uh, research that's going on currently with the Jumpstart programs and that has just been initiated. And so we hope that we can continue to do some research in that area as more Jumpstarts are initiated. And so um, that's in the works right now. And uh, so we're excited about that. I'm glad you mentioned the, the Plant Powered Metro New York, which is a huge uh, support group in the five boroughs. and. Uh, the, we've really partnered with them in terms of having them participate in our events and, and us and theirs and working together to really bring the community together. So that's been wonderful. Uh, Laura, can you say a, a little bit about this educational curriculum that we've, we have some funding for and with eCornell and the, the Gaples Institute that will hopefully get off the ground soon? Yeah, uh, so excited about this. This is the, known as the Food as Medicine Initiative. Um, and it's a collaboration between the Office of Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, the Committee of Plant-Based Health and Nutrition at Downstate, and as you mentioned, the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies and the Gables Institute. So President Adams and his office ha have recognized the pressing need to get nutrition training in medical schools and has generously provided funding to enroll downstate students in, as well as public health students in an online nutrition course. And we are very grateful for the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies for creating an abridged version of their larger plant-based nutrition certificate course that is specifically tailored to students. And we are launching this program in the next few weeks. We are very much excited um, and already we had, we, we had a, um, a survey to gauge interest, student interest in the program and already 80 medical students were very eager to join. And I think we're, it's gonna be a great success. Um, it's a beautiful platform. Um, and I think medical students know that they are lacking in nutrition training and using kind of that impetus to provide information on whole food plant-based diets in particular which we know is the most powerful diet in preventing and reversing disease um, is, is a great way forward. 
Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And we, we do have a nice, robust nutrition curriculum. And the intent of this program was not to replace it, but to bring in, as Dr. Campbell was speaking before, to, to get towards this paradigm, this mind shift towards food as medicine, towards the more, more holistic concept of that. And uh, uh, we're hoping to, we have funding for about 150 people to take these uh, two, three hour roughly courses and give some feedback. So we're going to expand it beyond the College of Medicine to the School of Public Health to potential other graduate students, residents. And uh, I think it's going to be um, uh, great. Uh, you know, going back to you, Gabby, uh, you know, hopefully we will get the garden going. I know uh, it, it's been a, uh, a tough one to get going. Um, do you think there, there should be gardens or similar clubs to dine? I don't know if you're aware of it. Other SUNY campuses or health science centers? Is this something just for downstate or where do you see this going? Um, I must say that um, it's for everyone. It's for every campus. Um, a garden is such a beautiful uh, thing to have anywhere um, uh, if resources are available. <laughs> um, but um, at downstate, I think that you know, having a garden here uh, would be kind of like um, having such a beautiful uh, community gathering opportunity um, at the in the heart of Brooklyn, uh, mm -hmm. really, and that would benefit so many people uh, from patients to, uh, as you mentioned, students learning, wanting to learn about nutrition. Uh, and uh, the people who work at Downstate also, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing to have um, anywhere and everywhere. Yeah, oh, 100% and we'll hopefully see that garden soon. Um, Jigar, last question for you is uh, getting back to your grant, your initiative, which I think will take place with or without formal funding from Alpha Omega Alpha, because there's such interest in it. Uh, you know, we have a pretty unique community in central Brooklyn. So uh, how have you been sort of adapting your approach to this, to the unique needs of a, um, a very culturally uh, specific community? You know, a lot of um, uh, Haitian, Caribbean, uh, Hispanic, African-American, as was mentioned earlier, diabetes is a problem. Um, how do you see that as influencing the things we do at Downstate? I think that, um, that our approach to the community has to have our, our community in mind in the sense that we have to approach it with cultural humility. Um, our, like you said, we have a large Caribbean population, a large um, population with uh, Latin American heritage as well. And that's the beautiful thing about this, a taste of African heritage curriculum. It's built um, by, uh, it's built on the African heritage diet pyramid. And the way these, these cooking demos work and every single session works is that we take uh, dishes from different parts of the African diaspora and engage with that diversity and provide healthy and delicious um, um, recipes and, mm. and demonstrations to, for, for our patients to choose from and our community. Yeah, I, so, you know, just again, the, the enthusiasm, the work, the accomplishments of these students is staggering. There are plenty of others who are involved too, but it, it's a joy to work with them. I, I think they're doing wonderful things that are gonna influence the downstate community for many, many years to come. And uh, we're very appreciative. So we're gonna conclude this panel now. I'd ask the students to stay live with us and I'm gonna see if uh, for our question and answer session, if uh, uh, Susan Banigas can come back in and uh, uh, are you still there, Susan? Yeah, there you I'm are. I'm here, Rich. I yes. don't know if Dr. Campbell is there, but if he is, uh, we'd, oh, there you are. Nice to see you. Um, and uh, Dr. Brangman, are you still with us? I know she had another obligation, so she might not be there. Um, but I'm gonna look, we do have um, a number of questions submitted. And Susan, I'm gonna start with you. 
Um, the question is, do you need to be medically qualified to become certified in lifestyle medicine? Uh, there are a number of, of pathways uh, from a health coach standpoint, which is an important member of the practice team. Uh, there's an opportunity to earn a certificate uh, in lifestyle uh, as a lifestyle health coach, lifestyle medicine health coach. Uh, and then through the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine, it certifies MDs and DOs who sit for that board exam. And then the American College of Lifestyle Medicine uh, certifies PhD level, uh, master's level, and a few select level bachelor's degrees that represent allied health professional fields. And so the full list of all who are eligible can be found at lifestylemedicine.org uh, under the, the certification page. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back to Dr. Campbell because there were some questions we didn't have uh, time to get to. And uh, here's one. Uh, education about nutrition has always existed, but the information has generally been wrong. We've been told by doctors, by our, our government and so-called, quote, nutrition experts, end quote, that milk, white bread, and steak are all good for us. How do you suggest offering correct nutritional information in a widespread fashion? And how do we build public trust uh, by, by aligning plant-based experts uh, with so many others that give us misinformation? Boy, that, that is the $65, $64 million question. Um, and how do you make this really happen? Um, I don't know. I, I think I uh, haven't had the experience I had in uh, policy, you know, at the national level. I think that's a very significant entre door, doorway in a sense. Um, we, we live with a paradigm to start with, all of us do, with this idea of really focus on one nutrient at a time, one food at a time, one this, one that. We're not even actually able to share all of this information as biology would have it. I think uh, the government, in this particular case, to get closer to your question, um, can actually take some ac actions that really are important, or at least we should bring this up, namely, uh, the education of our primary health caretakers, physicians, nurses, even dietitians and so forth, uh, they are not getting adequate compensation for this activity, not getting adequate training. I would suggest the government, if it wants to start putting money into something, uh, you know, in, in this regard, they can make, begin to help in supporting uh, medical schools to offer this course of nutrition. Right now, we, I've been quite involved in some of that, this idea in different medical schools. And uh, they always say that all their, their training programs are filled up and there's not enough room for that and so forth and so on. It would happen, it's gonna to have to take a little bit of strong arm tactics. Here's somebody, you, I, I don't know whether I want to go this far or not, it's a little bit too intrusive for government for me in a sense, but you know, if they, if medical schools get a lot of federal funding, if they want to keep that funding, they've got to agree to offer a nutrition curriculum. A little bit strong on tactics, but uh, I think that's what's going to be needed in this case because we've gone long enough with this information. Uh, talking about this, I know since the 1950s, according to some evidence that was collated by my son, who's a physician, by the way, but uh, getting professionals educated in nutrition. Mm -hmm. It really is, it's extremely important. And I, I think the, the ACLM with the Susan has been so instrumental. I can't give enough compliments to Susan, what she's done with that organization and also the Plant Nutrition Project, the Associated Project as well. Uh, now is the time. We got ACLM activity coming front and center. Uh, that can, that's a participating way of, of getting involved. And I think the government, uh, this becomes too much of a political statement on my part, perhaps, but uh, I think the government really 
uh, needs to step up to the plate and say, look, if you're going to get federal funding for any kind of programs, it's time that you know you do the following. Nutrition has got to be offered in the medical school curriculum and the nursing school curriculum. I, I don't know how else to say that. I, it's going to take some discussion to make it happen, but it's time for, you know, <laughs> coming down hard on this question and say it's mandatory. It's got to happen. Yeah, it, uh, it, it calls to mind uh, Michael Greger's analogy how in the 1960s, uh, despite all the warnings and evidence, uh, doctors were not on board with anti-smoking campaigns. And why? Because 90% of doctors smoke themselves. That's right. um, if Nirvana in medicine is having a pharmaceutical company take you out to a steakhouse for a $100 porter steak with cream spinach, a baked potato with sour cream and chives loaded with butter, are you the type of person that's gonna go, then go tell your patients to eat plants? Um, probably not. So I, I think we, we have to push that tipping point. And as you said, through government, through education and medical school, that, that I think is the way we will we'll change it. But um, it, it just seems that uh, until the doctors change, it's, um, we're gonna be pushing that, that flywheel uphill. It's, it's gonna be a little tough. Um, let me go to the students. There's a, an interesting question here from somebody at SUNY Purchase College in Westchester. Uh, very impressed with all the student work. And the question is, uh, and any of the students can respond to this, does the Lifestyle Medicine Interest Group, are you interested in offering meetings with students at other campuses, with their campus to share the message and to help uh, you know, spread the model or you know, meet with some of their students and apparently this is through a dance conservatory. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, we are definitely open to that. Um, so we can tell you about our successes, our challenges, um, our sustainability plan as far as, you know, having this continue on even past when we graduate. And so we do have a website, downstatelmig.com. And um, please go there and there's a contact uh, tab, shoot us an email and we will be more than happy to um, share the wealth of information and, and, and collaborate. Great, and uh, it, it really is a student effort. I mean, I mean it's amazing. So they have a lot to, to share. Um, something really interesting here, and let, let me see if I can find where that was. Uh, and this could go out to anyone, but I, I pose it mainly to Susan or, or, or Colin. And, and the question was, if, uh, you know, if you're already whole food, plant-based, you have a great lifestyle, do you need a COVID vaccine? <laughs> Or, or are you already protected? Is that good enough resilience and protection, just having the right lifestyle and, and a whole food plant-based diet? An interesting uh, question. Any thoughts? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm gonna make a comment here. Uh, very sensitive question, as we all know. One's gotta be careful with this kind of thing. It's a very personal decision that people have to make. On the one hand, on the other hand, I just published a paper just recently peer review journal, good journal, on data we had from China. This is on a, a very serious virus, more serious than coronavirus, by the way. It's the number one viral disease in the world, killing something like close to 800,000 people a year. I've been working with that off and on for 30, 35 years. We collected information among some 9,000 people in China some years ago on the the active virus, that's the antigen activity versus the antibody activity in these 9,000 people as to whether or not they got the virus outcome. The virus outcome in this case is cancer, liver cancer. Okay, so liver cancer is caused by a virus. We measured the antigen activity of the virus in about, as I say, about close to 9,000 people and expresses prevalence of antigen activity or prevalence of antibody. Striking results, just highly, highly significant. People who consume plants form more antibodies, very simply. 
and they don't get liver cancer. People who consume animal-based foods, uh, they retain the antigen activity, they get liver cancer. And it's only a small consumption of animal foods, only in the neighborhood like 10% of what we do in the West here in this country. So somewhere around a diet containing around 10% of the animal protein we get in the West, just a very small amount. They're the ones that get the liver cancer. Those consuming more plants don't. That's simple. People who get exposed or infected by the virus, uh, basically, if they're eating plants, they form antibodies. If they're more inclined to consume some animal food, and it takes a very small amount, surprisingly, they don't form the antibodies and they get the cancer. Now, the question and concern that most people is, well, this is a, a one kind of virus, coronavirus, the different kind. Does it apply? My answer to that is that the activity of these viruses depends to a great extent on the, the, the extent to which the immune system is operative. And keeping a healthy immune system, we know there's a whole lot of social and other kinds of factors that affect our immune system, but there's nothing like diet. It's really, really strong. And so what I'm excited about in this case, the same strategy used to reverse heart disease and maybe cancer and diabetes, once again, we're seeing the same thing. A plant-based diet basically keeps under control that very serious virus. I'm suggesting, I have to say hypothesis, that's the way to get immunity. Those people consume over our plants to get immunity. It really begs the question, and I know this, as I say, is very sensitive, but we have to be careful about this. Those who are already consuming the plants are getting immunity in a safe way, and it's long-lasting. So I think that's... Uh, be that uh, what, what it may. <laughs> no, probably a, a great way to sum it up that um, I think the major theme uh, of this conference, which relates to sustainability, health, and wellness, and COVID, is that you know, we never know what's around the corner as far as whether it's our personal health challenge or a, or a pandemic, uh, God forbid, or, or other things. But what we can do is put ourselves in the best ability to deal with whatever comes by building our health, our wellness, our resilience through lifestyle medicine. And as was mentioned repeatedly, that's a very plant forward plant-based approach, uh, whole food plant-based is the center of it. And then you bring in the other pillars that um, Susan mentioned, uh, including um, adequate exercise, physical activity, restorative sleep, positive social connections, mindfulness, stress reduction, um, avoiding smoking, limiting risky substances, et cetera. And if you do those things, um, you'll be in good shape to fight challenges. And if you talk anecdotally to people who have done this, uh, including myself, uh, you know, we rarely get sick, uh, uh, lots more energy, uh, better focus and function. I mean, it's incredible the, the personal change you see. So hopefully this uh, uh, webinar will, will inspire some changes in, at the the system level at education, at the student level, in our health science campuses, and hopefully uh, in the government, in NIH. I don't know if they're gonna look at the webinar, but I know that Dr. Campbell is a force to be reckoned with and uh, <laughs> with him banging the drums, uh, it's gonna be hard not to dance to the beat. So uh, we will remain hopeful on that. And um, with that, let me thank everyone for their incredible participation and presentations. Uh, um, and uh, in concluding, I will will just ask um, uh, Jennifer Snyder, our program coordinator, if there's any last words she has regarding, I believe this has been recorded and will be available. There's also been a query as to whether we can have access to Dr. Benegut, to Susan's slides um, uh, to review those. So. Um, Jennifer, can you give us some uh, concluding words, please? Uh, sure. Uh, once again, thank you, everyone, for participating. We're glad to see such a large crowd today. Um, we will be sending out a recording link to those that were registered, and uh, we will be happy to include uh, Susan's slides as well. 
Thank you. So.